Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. Hey, good morning, everybody. Beautiful Carolina winter going on outside right now. That's what we do. But uh, it's good to have you guys here. I'm excited today about the passage we're going to be in because the passage we're going to study in the scripture today is one of the most famous in all the Bible. And so if you have your uh, Bibles handy, open up to Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6. And uh, we're going to be talking about a miraculous meal, a miraculous meal. So I know when it comes to following the Lord that we are all in different places. Like I know there are some typically in a church service that you're here and you're not even sure why you're here. Like like somebody invited you when I was younger, my mom made me go, you know, whatever it is. I I mean, I get it. You're just, you're just here because you don't even know. Like, and I would say this to you, that God has you here on purpose, but I'll let you wrestle with all that stuff. Um, There's others who I think are newer uh, at this and you're like, listen, I get it. I believe in Jesus. I believe the Bible. I, I believe I should be in church, like I'm, but I'm still trying to figure things out. Like, that's totally cool. We get it. There's others who have been walking with the Lord for what we'd say is, you know, you've been walking a minute, and you've got some tread on the tires, but, but here's something you have discovered as well, and I, at least this is what I've discovered. The, the, the closer I feel like I draw to the Lord, the further away he feels. I, like, I don't even know how to describe that. It's just that, that I realize how much more complex and deep and mysterious he is the, the further I uh, go towards him. So I don't know, maybe just in my own head. But I will say this, the Lord continues to surprise me. I've not gotten to the point where I've figured him out yet. I, I, just to be fair, I, like, he continues to surprise me. And here's what I've really learned. There's this moment of your faith when, when you really learn what it means to put your weight on Jesus. When you really lean into Jesus and he just does something that is it's really hard to articulate. And that's when your, your faith and your reason just kind of mesh together and you just realize there's this God who loves you way more than you could ever understand, and it's awesome. And, uh, and the disciples, as we study them this morning, they're in the middle of still figuring that out. You know, I can only imagine only being with Jesus for a couple of years, and you're already be given, you're given assignments now that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to teach on his behalf. You're supposed to work miracles on his behalf. I mean, I, I can't imagine what they're processing just mentally and emotionally. Thank, thank the Lord literally for the Spirit of God who would help them to be more and to do more and to say more than they ever could have done on their own, which is what he does for us today. But this is where we're going to pick up today in Mark chapter 6. Now, To go into Mark chapter 6, we've got to pop back to Mark 6 verse 7. So we're going to be starting in verse 30 today, but we're going to go back to verse 7 to pick up something important. So it says, Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So there was this moment when Jesus said, listen guys, you've been with me. You've heard what I've taught. You've seen what I've done. Now I'm going to send you out in pairs. So each of you is going to take a buddy, and you're going to go out into the villages, and you're going to teach the same things I've been teaching. You're going to do the same kind of stuff that I've been doing, and I'm giving you authority, authority even over unclean spirits. And so I want you guys to go do this. And so they go out, and I'm sure even to their own amazement, people are listening to them. Even the things they're saying, I'm sure. They're like, did I just say that? Did that just come out of me? Like God is using me here in such dynamic ways. And they find that the the spirits, the evil spirits even submit themselves to them. Just this amazing moment. And so now we're going to see what happens when they kind of return from that mission together and they report back to Jesus. And that's what brings us to Mark chapter 6, verse 30, and uh, this idea of this needed break. Verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So they're coming back now, and they're just reporting. They're like, okay, we're going back. Jesus, you're not going to believe. I I don't know. Could you ever say that phrase to Jesus? You're not going to believe this. Uh, But anyway, so they come back, and they report on all this stuff. It's an amazing. And so it says the apostles returned. I want to talk just a brief moment about the word apostle. So apostle literally is just a reference to one who is sent. And in this case, we're referring to Jesus sending these people. But it's just like using the word messenger. Like, you know, the messengers came back. They're talking to Jesus. But because Jesus did it, the, the word almost now has become a title, and it has. It's even used as a title before we get out of the New Testament. That is the apostles. It's a reference to the 12, the big 12. And that's, and that's what I would call apostle with a capital A. And the only reason I would say that is because in some churches today, you'll go there and you may hear somebody speak, and they would stand up and say like, well, hey, I'm apostle, you know, whatever, and they put their name there. So apostle in that sense isn't 
quite like they've literally been chosen by Jesus to go and speak, although you could argue that spiritually. But probably what it really just means is that I'm under the authority of the church, I'm under the authority of the Lord, and this is a title that I'm using. But I always differentiate between the capital A apostles and the little a apostles. And so these are the capital A apostles, those who've been sent by Jesus. And then we get to verse uh, 31 and 32. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. All right, so the apostles' mission worked. It it did. And and Jesus' fame has been growing. And so people now know all throughout the region that Jesus is healing people. He's doing miracles. He speaks with this spiritual authority, this moral authority that when you hear him talk, you realize just he's wise beyond his years. I was just amazing. And so people are seeking him out. So have you ever, have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I wish I was famous. Or did you ever, have you ever thought that? Like, I wish I was famous for like a day. That's all you'd want it is for a day because you would hate it. You, you would hate being famous. I mean, imagine you can't go to the restroom without somebody going, hey, aren't you? Like, and you're like you couldn't have a meal. You'd be sitting there trying to have a meal with some friends, and people would be running up, hey, can I get your autograph real quick? Hey, can we get a picture real quick? Do you mind if I did, like, and it would just never end. It's just over and over. I mean, fame would go away, the desire for it would go away so quickly. Uh, you want the stuff that comes with it, you just don't want all the attention that comes with it, and only in seasons. And so, now imagine, though, that it's not just that, right? I mean, this, this isn't like Will Smith walking down the street. This isn't Ryan Reynolds walking down the street. This isn't my favorite theologian, D.A. Carson, walking down the street, who I would hound for a picture and an autograph. Like, this is is not that. This is somebody who is Messiah. This is God on earth in flesh who has come to, to bring to us a word for the moment, for the day, and ultimately salvation. This isn't just any old guy. This is somebody who can heal with a word. This is somebody who, who, with his thoughts, can make things happen that you and I would never be able to do. I mean, this is, this is God's blessing on earth. So I, I get the idea that when the, the disciples show up um, and Jesus comes to them and says, listen, you've been th- through a hard time of ministry. I want you to just come away. We're going to go to a desolate place, and we're going to get away from it all for a season. And that's a pattern we actually see in Scripture where Jesus himself would pull away to a desolate place. Now, a desolate place, I don't know what you think of with a desolate place, but I, I would say this. Um, like, for me and for many others, like, we connect with God in nature like nowhere else. I mean, there's something about taking a walk in the woods, uh, something about sitting by a stream. I mean, there's something about looking uh, up in the, the clouds, uh, it being in, like, virgin territory, sitting on a rock, looking over, like, a, a valley or something. Like, there's something about that for me, looking up at the stars at night. But not everybody's that way. I do know that. Not everybody's that way. Some people hate nature. <laughs> they try to stay away from nature. They're like, God created air conditioning for a reason. You know, so, and, and if you're that, I, like, I don't know where your desolate place is. Um, but we all need it. And this idea of Sabbath, like, okay, okay. If you remember the Ten Commandments, there's this understanding of the Sabbath, that we need to uh, honor the Sabbath, we need to keep it holy. And, but, but see, we're not under law anymore, but I think the principle is still there. So here's what God knows about you and me. He knows that you can do pretty good for about six days, and then you need a day where you just take a break. Like, you've just got to, you got to have some downtime. And that's why I love the words that he says to the disciples. He comes to me and says, come away by yourselves, to a desolate place, and just, just rest a while. I mean, I, I get it. Like, the disciples are taxed. Jesus, even in his human body, he is spent, and he just needs some time away. But I also get the people pursuing him. Like, the, you know, these are people who don't just want an autograph. These are people who are sick. They're desperate. They're oppressed. They need rescue. And Jesus is supposed to be Messiah, right? This is, he's, he's the one bringing to us the word of God. So they're seeking him out. And Jesus literally is at this point where, hey, just, we just need a moment. We just need some time. And so they get in a boat, and they're going to they're gonna go away and just try to get away from it all. So let me just encourage you in this. If these words of Jesus come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. If those resonate with you, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I need that, I need that. Okay, then this is for you. Like, don't, yeah, we're, in this culture, we can push ourselves so hard. You know, and I'll be honest, I've thought this before a number of times. I wish I had a day off so I could get more done. I've literally thought that. Like, I've got so many projects I want to get to. And then you reach the whole way. And if you've ever had to do this, and some of you have had to do this, where you work all week, maybe it's just called parenting, where you work all week, 
and you get to the next day and you got to start the whole thing over again and you know there was no break this week probably not going to be one this way like this just is horrible right so jesus knows we're not designed that way and when you dishonor a break when you dishonor a sabbath experience um it's detrimental to you and so I encourage you to get away. I will give you a couple of things to think about. If you decide that I'm going to do this, and I don't, you'll have to work it in your schedule. I don't know how it works. You got to take control of your own schedule. But that day you set aside, let me give you a couple of things here. One is, um, it's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time to take a Sabbath. In, in fact, I would call it this. It is productive unproductivity. It's productive unproductivity. You don't have to have accomplished anything over the course of that day. You just need to rest. But, it's also a day, if I could offer, away from your cell phone. Anybody here realize you probably need to fast from your cell phone? Yeah, probably everybody. It's like that moment where like, if, if, try this. I, th- I, I challenge you for an hour to turn off your phone. Now some of you would be like, oh, no problem at all. No, I'm not talking to you. You're, you're not the ones. It's the ones who like, when you set your cell phone down and walk away, it's like you've forgotten a child. You know, like, where is it? I've got to find it. I need to write it. You know, or to the person who feels their cell phone ringing only to reach in their pocket and realize they don't have it right? Like that's, you're the ones, right? That, that where if you turn off your phone and walked away, you'd be like, oh, that reminds me, I gotta, oh, oh, where's my, like, and you could, didn't get 10 feet before you're in a panic over your cell phone. Or if you left your home without your cell phone and, you know, you're wanting to call 911, right? Like, it's just like, I've got to have this thing. I'm so dependent on it. You're the one. And you turn off your cell phone for a full day and just set it aside. There is no emergency that is so severe, somebody can't find you if they absolutely need you, right? Listen, we existed thousands of years all right, so I, I know I'm big on the cell phone thing, and I can be honest, I'm preaching to myself. Uh, this is, you all get to experience it. This is what it's for. All right, so the cell phone's one. Another thing, a Sabbath is not binge watching Netflix, all right? It is not, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna catch up on my favorite show and watch every episode. I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying that's not a Sabbath. The Sabbath is, in Jesus' words, point away to this desolate place, meaning there's no distractions, and I, I just have time to think. And if you say, well, can I bring my Bible? Absolutely. Like spending time with the Lord is part of Sabbath. You know, that you pull aside, read the Bible, uh, spend some time in prayer. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I can pull that off for eight to 10 hours. Like I'm not asking you for eight to 10 hours. Just, you make it a part of your day and the rest of it, find some leisurely stuff that doesn't stress you, that is life-giving and you feel like you can walk with the Lord through it. That's what I'm saying. So just something to think about. Don't, don't kill yourself in this life because it's too easy to do that. And as a uh, church, we actually recommend to our staff that uh, they take a sabbatical, which is an extended Sabbath. And so uh, we have a member of our staff on sabbatical right now. That's Pastor Chris Ledley. And Pastor Chris will be on through the end of March. And we have another staff member who's about to go on sabbatical. And that's uh, Pastor Jack Mandel. So Jack, why don't you come out here real quick? So uh, Jack, our guitar aficionado, worship pastor. Thank you. I've got a fan. (laughs) You do have a fan. You know, it's so funny too, like this morning, like, people have no idea. I mean, maybe you do, because you're watching it. Do you know how embarrassing it is to get up to lead a group of people in worship and to have things fail? I mean, it's a, it's a, and everybody's looking at you like, you didn't think about this beforehand? You didn't, you know, and you're like, I did. I thought of everything. So anyway. Uh, it just keeps you humble. It's just a thing. Okay, so here's, here's the deal. Um, the reason we, as a board um, and leadership at the church, request that Um, staff members take a sabbatical because we get this. We get that busy seasons kind of go on and on and on and you need to pull back. And so every five years, we allow our staff members to take a, up to a three-month sabbatical. And before they do it, they have to turn into us uh, a sabbatical plan. Now, the reason we want them to turn in a sabbatical plan is not so that we can make sure they're doing enough stuff on their sabbatical. It's so we can make sure they're not doing too much stuff on their sabbatical. Like if you're saying, I need a sabbatical so I can go take a class and I can work on this paper. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I think you've missed the point. Like for the sabbaticals that you're not doing all that. And so, Jack... What are you not doing and what are you doing on your sabbatical? Well, that's an excellent question. I need to change the Netflix thing now, apparently. <laughs> um, but no, not really. Um, so d- the pace of ministry, um, full-time ministry, is, is such that we often lament as a staff over the last 15 years, that we don't have time to celebrate what God is doing. Like we get through one event, one season of something, one time of counseling or whatever, and then we're on to the next one. <clears throat> and, um, you know, there's the joke that um, pastors or worship pastors or whatever uh, spend two, two to four hours a week working and then the rest are just playing. But that's not really true at all. And um, 
and it, it becomes difficult. But, you know, part of this is, I was reading this verse, Ephesians starting chapter two, verses, uh, starting in verse eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I think what we often do is we get the good works part first. Um, our, our faith becomes, or my faith, I and mean, let me make this personal, my faith, and uh, maybe some of you are like me, it becomes transactional, and that these are um, things I need to do to prove I'm a Christian, or to be a Christian, or to please God. But that's not at all how God's economy works. You know, he has given us everything in Christ Jesus, and it is only through faith, by his grace, he's the author and the finisher of my faith, and that means I'm now in his family. I am his child, not by something I've done or not by something I haven't done. And the works that we do are just a natural outflowing of being God's child on this earth. But it gets too easy to flip it around and to kind of maintain the works. Um, and that's a burden, you know, that, that doesn't earn you anything with God and it just destroys your life. Mm -hmm. So the things I'm not doing, I won't be here much. Um, I'm hoping to have some time of being able to pull away spiritually um, and even like visit some, a bunch of other churches, worship with them, get to experience that. Um, and then there's some people who are geographically not year, near and because of time, haven't been able to connect with them. So I'm hoping to do that. And there are some things I wanna learn and other stuff, yeah. but um, there's a lot I will try not to do, including hang on my phone so much. Uh, thanks <laughs> for that conviction. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's good. I saw you, you know, pull up the Bible on your phone. I know, well. it's like I gotta but get my actual paper well, Bible out. You, yeah, they actually have started printing off a version now that you, you can kidding? use on paper. So yeah. I should I get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what we want to do. We want to pray for Pastor Jack and we're gonna pray for Pastor Chris and then uh, Pastor Tom has one coming up in the fall and then right behind him are Pastors Malcolm and Sean. And so uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, our brother Jack and how he leads us, leads the worship team and just nourishes us our soul spiritually. He does so much behind the scenes here that I'm sure most people are unaware of. And Father, I would pray for this season of Sabbath that you would help him to find that desolate place in a good way where he meets with you and he has legitimate peace and refreshes and comes back to us recharged. Father, we thank you too for Pastor Chris, who's on sabbatical right now. We pray you will nourish his soul and refresh him while he's away. And uh, Lord, as we move through this with uh, all of us trying to figure out how to walk well with you and to take that pace where we get uh, an appropriate Sabbath, uh, Lord, I pray for your wisdom, and we'll just trust you to provide your fruit. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, brother. I remember talking about this uh, sabbatical principle uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and a friend of mine came up to me, and he's like, man, he's like, y'all talk about that. He's like, I wish I could take one of those. And I'm like, you know, I get it. I get it. And so in your work world, that may not work, but I bet there's a version of it you could do if you were just creative, whether you start to combine some of your weeks off or whatever it would be. Uh, but I just encourage you to just understand God knows that we're wired to work and work too much. And, and it's always kind of a weird line, right? You could either be a workaholic or you could be slothful. Um, but if you're wrestling with which you are, you're probably towards the workaholic at that point. Um, all right, well, let's go forward here. So he, he wants to do this. He tells them to come aside. They need the break. And then we find out about this compassionate Savior. Look at verses 33 and 34. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Like, can you just imagine how demotivating it is? Like, so you want to get away. You're like, I've, I've planned this week or I've planned this day and I just want to get away. And as soon as you get to where you're going, there's a ton of people there waiting on you going, yeah, we're glad you're here. And you're like, oh, like I can just, because this is what it's like. If you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, like if you've never been to Israel, you got to go to Israel. But one of the things that will strike you is the Sea of Galilee. Because if you're like me, you're picturing this big ocean like, it's not at all. It is like smaller than Lake Murray. It is like, you can see the, both, all the sides. Uh, you stand on the side of the Sea of Galilee and you can see every part of the shoreline. And so when Jesus and his disciples get in the boat, like we're going to go to a desolate place, they get in their boat, they start going and people are like, 
hey, isn't that, uh, isn't that Jesus and his disciples? And they're like, I think it is, you know? So they, they're running ahead. And I can just imagine as they're like going across the water, just going, oh, this is horrible, you know? And then they show up and people are like, you know, we need you. And so it's just, it's just a really hard thing. I get it. But Jesus has compassion because he realizes that these are harassed people. They're like sheep without a shepherd, which, by the way, is a theme throughout all the scripture. You see in the Old Testament, you see in the New Testament, this idea that, that these people need hope, they need provision, they need leadership, spiritual leadership, and that's what Jesus offers. And so he shows up, and though he would rather get away and give the disciples time away, it's just not going to happen. And so he steps right back into ministry mode, and he begins to teach the people. And, you know, again, these people, they're not... They're not paparazzi chasing a star around on a, on a speeding, you know, car chase just so they can get a good picture. Uh, these are desperate people, and they're looking for hope. And some of them have traveled a long way just to get there, just to find him, and, and have legitimate needs. And Jesus recognizes that. And so he spends the day teaching them. And then after that, we get this, what I would call a meal with a lesson. Uh, let's go to verses 35 and through 38. And when it grew late... His disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said five and two fish. Okay, so I love this. There's so many events in Scripture I love just to see. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to. I don't want to experience them because it seems like the disciples were always in trouble and had a hard time understanding Jesus. But, but here he is with them, and I love the moment where they come to him. And they're like, okay, and I love counseling Jesus. That's always one of my favorite things. Like, hey, Lord, uh, the people here, they're this. It's been a long day. They're exhausted. They're tired, and they're starving. Like you've got to send these people to get something to eat. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and says. You give them something to eat. Now, how long do you think there was silence after that? See, like, like there's moments in the scripture we just don't get to experience because we're just reading it. But I, just, I have to believe when Jesus says, you give them something to eat, that there's a moment where they're just looking at each other like, what did he just say? Like, I don't, I don't have something to eat. Peter, say something. You know, we like, none of us has anything. You know, and so they're looking around at each other, and then one of them says, if we took a year's salary of an average person and we went and bought, you know, from the surrounding towns, like, is that what you want us to do? There's no way that'll work. So I love this moment. Now, keep in mind here, this moment is set up by Jesus. It's not an accident. There's, a, there's, no, there's no mistake. It's not like Jesus is like, oh, I didn't think about that. He set up the moment. He knew people would seek him out. He knew they'd get to a point where they were hungry. He knew it'd get to a point where he would tell his disciples, you do it, and he knew they'd have no answer. And I think he does it on purpose for this reason. I think he wants you to get to the end of yourself as quickly as possible and look at him and say, there's no way this can happen. And then he can look at you and say, I know, I know. Like, I, I, I think even moments in your own life, and some of you are there, like you've gotten to the end of yourself, you are desperate for help, and you're looking to the Lord and going, Lord, I don't know what to do. And the Lord is looking at you going, I know. Because see here, I, this is what I think, he, I think he delights when we come to the end of ourselves, and now we have no other hope but him. Because then he can work, right? Until then, we're trying to figure it out, maybe even taking too much of the credit ourselves. I'll give you a perfect example of this. So when our church was younger, we were meeting in schools in the community. We were meeting in the Summit Parkway Middle School. And um, the, the uh, principal of the Summit Parkway Middle School did not like us, which he told me. And it got to a point where they figured out how to kick us out of the school, and they did kick us out of the school, not for anything we'd done, just because they didn't want us there anymore, which he told me plainly in his office. And, uh, and so we left there, and I was so angry, and I was so frustrated, and I went and I reported back to our leadership and our small church, and I was just like, you know, we're getting kicked out of the school, I don't know what we're going to do. And if you had asked me in the moment, I would have said, this is Satan. Like, Satan is coming against us. He's trying to put us... And there were people who were with me. We're like, oh, he's trying to get us. You know, like, we're not going to do it. We're going to stand up. And we were trying everything possible. And then, like, at the last minute, an opening turned up at Bookman Road Elementary School. Well, here's the thing. I didn't want to go to Bookman Road Elementary School. It was, like, a couple miles away. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. We're trying to plant here, like, right by the summit area. And here where we... I was like, that was a bad area. And I was so angry. And then we go there, and we start meeting there. 
And the church just took off. We probably doubled within a year, and there were so many signs of health and amazing things were happening. And then I realized all this time, I'd been blaming Satan when I should have been giving God glory. You know, so now I was sinning in the midst of it. Like, it's, it's like it's even worse now. Like, not, not only was it not Satan, I was blaming him, and it was God who was doing all this great stuff, and he was working a miracle. So I'm just sitting there going, like, I am so foolish sometimes. So here's the thing. You've got to get to the end of yourself where you're going, I don't know what to do, and then God's like, I know. Now you can trust me, right? He's got to take it all away so we can trust him. That's exactly what's going on in this moment. And that moment when he says, you guys give him something to eat, that moment, the calculations that follow, that silence, the, the I don't know what we're going to do, like this really important. You've got to get to that point where you've done all the math and you say, there's no logical way this will ever work. Because here's the problem. Your logic messes with your faith. It does. You're logic because you get there. You're like, I don't see how that could happen. That's never going to happen. What's going to happen? I don't know. And then you go to this panic, and I get this all the time. People call me all the time. I don't know what we're going to do. We're just for help. We're going to be like, over. you're like, and I, I do love this. Um, I have a friend of mine that's a pastor, and somebody called him desperate, and they're like, you know, and it was a financial desperation. They're like, we need, you know, however many hundred dollars by the end of the day, or they're going to turn our lights off. And he said, oh, that's too bad. I'm going to pray for you. And they're like. Our lights are going to be turned off. Our power will be cut off. And he's like, I know. You're going to be okay. I, mean, I just love it. And he, and he said, no, no, no. He said, that wasn't me being mean to them. That was me teaching them something about how to trust in the Lord. And he's like, Here, you know what happened? They found the money. They got their lights kept on. You know, it's like, it wasn't, they had to come to the end of their resources so they could totally trust God. And then God did something miraculous and provided for them anyway. So, like, that's the thing. It's like, when we're in a panic, God isn't. It's, there's no, it's not like God doesn't know you were going to get there. Right? So just pause and say, I've come to the end of myself and, and release your logic just a bit and lean into your faith. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have to be creative. It doesn't mean you don't have to do stuff. It doesn't mean you just sit back and God does everything. But when you're at the end of yourself, that's a great place to be. Uh, and this is why you brought him there. And you, then you might think about this. Five loaves, two fish. Why so little food? Well, a couple of things. One is, you know, it's not like they were planning on this day. This was a last minute thing. Like, there's Jesus, and they run to him. So nobody packed. This wasn't like an event they were going to go to next week, and hey, let's make sure we do this, do this, pack a day bag, take some snacks. Also, if people did have food, they've eaten most of it sitting there all day. This is just a few meager provisions that are left over. And I love that the disciples have to go figure out how much there is. They have to meander among the people. And the scripture will tell us before we're done, there's 5,000 men, meaning the women and children weren't counted in that moment meaning there could be ten to 12,000 people there. Oh, we don't know. Thousands of people there. So he goes around, and he's interacting with the people. The disciples are interacting with the people, and all those calculations are important because they've got to come back to Jesus and look at him and just act like, there's no way this could be done. And Jesus is like, I know. That's what's going to make it awesome, right? And so they're going around to do this. They're gathering the, the five. Oh, and the fish. I should mention the fish. So the fish are probably cooked or cured, right? They're not like floppy wet kind of thing. I mean, it's not like there's some kid out there with a fish bowl and he brought Goldie to be, you know, part of this event. And the disciples are going around going like, Jesus needs your fish. And the, the kid's like, oh, this is my favorite pet goldfish, Goldie. And the disciples are like, you know, going away to feed this. It's not that. This is a, some sort of food, food-like fish. And so they bring it back to Jesus uh, to see what he can do. And he's about to do something amazing. So look, let's keep going. Verses 39 and going forward. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set them before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. All right, so first of all, the fact that he had him sit down in groups of 50s and 100s makes it easy to count. And so that's probably why we have such an accurate count of how many are there. Here's another thing, that in Judaism, there's a rule, and it's a rule you actually keep, most of you, today. The rule in Judaism is you do not eat a meal before you give thanks to the Lord. Now, for some of us, you have that inherent rule already. Nobody told you to do it. You just do it because you're either raised in that way or you just realized how thankful you are for all that God gives you. And so you pause and you give thanks, and that's what Jesus does. And I love this idea that he looks up to heaven and he gives thanks, reminding us that this is where our blessing comes from. Like all the good stuff in your life, it's not just because you worked really hard, right? It's because God takes care of his people. Like your capacity to work really hard, God gave you that. Your wiring, your mental stuff. I mean, everything about you, God gave you that. And so he pauses, he looks up to heaven, and then suddenly he has all this food. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I would love to see this miracle in action. Like, I want to know how this took place. Now, some of you don't know this about me. I used to be a magician. 
So I grew up, I started practicing magic in um, high school. I mean, you know, fun magic. You know, the kind of thing where it's all deception and all that stuff. So I, I did birthday parties. I did libraries. I performed at schools. I had a friend that I, I performed with a number of times. Like, like we were doing our own little thing, and it was great. But the great thing about magic, which I've always loved, is, is how you fool people, and yet you're doing it all right in front of them. Like, I love that. And I love being deceived, too, in that way. I love, I love magic. I love watching it. But this isn't magic. This is a miracle. And so literally, as Jesus is just sitting there breaking bread. He just keeps breaking bread, right? Like at some moment, you gotta be like, what is going on? Like if I was a disciple, I would have trouble serving the food because I'd be like, do the next basket. Do the next basket. I wanna see like how's, and he's just counting out the fish. And you're like, you're holding two and you're like just filling the basket. I'm like, well, how is this happening? And then I love this idea too that then he gives it to the disciples. And he's like, now go distribute to the groups. And this for me, what a metaphor of ministry. This, this is, I've just got an empty basket. But when the Lord puts something in it, I now have something to offer to others. Like just if, you're, if you serve people, if you serve in this ministry, like if you're ever sitting there going like, I don't know what I have to give, I don't know if I, like, yeah, exactly, you're an empty basket. But if Jesus puts something in it, now you have something to give. And so they're going around and they're distributing this to these people. And I just can't imagine trip after trip after trip going back and Jesus just keeps filling and just keeps filling and just keeps filling. What a crazy thing that's going on here. And it says here, let's not, let's not miss this too. I wanna go back to this. Uh, verse, uh, let's see, where is it? Verse 41, and taking the five loaves, two fish, he broke up to heaven, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the loaves, gave to the disciples, and set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. Let's go on. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces, uh, end of the fish, and those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. All right, so now Jesus has fed so much food that they're all satisfied. Have you ever catered a big event? So, you know, my daughter, Callie, uh, who is amazing and beautiful and takes after her mother in that way. So when she got married a couple years ago, she was like, okay, dad, mom, dad, I want to do this huge wedding and I want to invite hundreds of people. And I want to, and I was like, whew, like how much do you think this thing's going to cost? And then she gave us the number she was planning on, which we were like, oh, that's so fun. That's never going to happen. Um, and so we're like, either you can invite all those people and we're going to be eating like hot dogs or we shrink it down and we can have a little bit better meal. So we, we negotiated all that and she still had an amazing wedding it was amazing and but here's the thing you know like, like we're the we're the bride's parents so if you're the bride's parents you get to pay for all that and let me just tell you if you've got little girls at home right now your days are coming so you better start saving your money because that day comes and when it comes it comes big and like those caterers they don't care where you are in life they're not worried about like I, you know this is a hard time they're like here's how much it's going to cost i need that check now and you're like, oh, <laughs> and so you're writing these checks. And so, and that's, here's the thing, that's for one meal. Like that, that whole event, that whole wedding, which was worth every penny. Let me just say it was worth every penny, but it is an investment. And so now here's the disciples and they're like, Jesus like, you feed them. They're like, we don't have that kind of money. And even if they did have that kind of money, you wouldn't be able to go into those little towns and say, I need to feed 10,000 people. Like they're like, what? We got like three loaves of bread. That's just never going to happen. You know, so there's no way. Any of this could happen. And so the disciples are going back and forth. Now, I'm not sure the people knew initially who were sitting there being served. Like, they didn't know what all was going on. But somebody could do the math, right? Somebody could look up there and go, you know, there's no catering truck behind him. Like, where is he getting all this? Food? And he's just serving and serving and serving. I'm like, what a crazy moment this is. And he feeds them so much that they're all satisfied. And then 12 baskets are taken up with the leftovers, full of leftovers, and taken back to Jesus, which in itself is crazy. But here's what I'm reminded it up. Jesus is still teaching the disciples something about him. And here's something. You've got 12 full baskets, one for every disciple who struggled to understand what Jesus could do. And as they're carrying it back, oh gosh, how did he do it? You know, just this amazing moment where he teaches them a lesson about who he is. So can I tell you something? You need to learn that lesson. Jesus can take your meager circumstances, bless it, Make it overflow so much that it's not just a blessing to you, it's a blessing to everyone around you. And when the event is over, you'll even have leftovers. Like that's how Jesus works. And if you're saying, well, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, you're probably not at the end of your rope yet. He's gonna push you just a little bit further until you can finally look up and say, there's no way this can happen. And then he can look at you and say, I know. Right? That's what he wants for us. And that's this beautiful moment here of what he did. All right, so he's gotten to this. He's gotten to the end of the... Of the moment here, but you have to understand this actually causes a problem for Jesus. And the problem is this, that Jesus has kind of been doing his thing in smaller towns, but now it's getting bigger. 
More people are turning out. And what's he doing? He's feeding people. He's healing people. He's giving them the word of God. He speaks with one uh, who has moral and spiritual authority. How long is it going to be before people go, why are we submitting ourselves to the Romans? This guy could take care of us. Let's make him king. And in fact, that's what they try to do. Ultimately, in scripture, they try to force him to be king. And this is why things are getting a little weird for Jesus at this moment. All right, so here we are at the end of this. And let me just pause to acknowledge, let's acknowledge the real miracle. The real miracle is not the food. Because that thing Jesus did with the food, he still does today, and he still does it in your life and my life. Taking us to the end of ourselves, desperate, I don't know what to do. And he's like, I know, now I can work. So this is, this is where Jesus uh, wants to take all of us. And so now, at the end of this, the real miracle is not the food, it's Jesus. The real miracle is that we have a Savior who loves us so much that he gives us what we don't deserve. He gives it in abundance, and then he blesses us ridiculously. This is our Lord. Uh, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to pause this morning. We're going to have a brief moment of just a prayer of repentance in our own heads. And the first thing we're going to talk to Jesus about is the fact that we so often underrate what he can do in our lives and wants to do. And then we're going to thank him for the abundance he pours out on us when we really lean into him by faith. And then I want to add a prayer onto this. Um, you know, we've got events happening in the world all around us today, and one of those events is what's going on in Ukraine. And so Ukraine is currently being invaded by Russia. Uh, it's a nightmare situation. Common people are having to take up arms against a well-fortified army who are, who are just coming through their cities and, and villages. And uh, that's just a horrible moment. I think about the people there. I think about the atrocity going on. And this stuff happens, I know. It happens all the time, all over the world. This one's just national, and it's just something that's making me think about. Uh, I've had friends who serve there as missionaries. Um, they've, they've got their churches that are over there. I mean, this is, you know, our brothers and sisters of faith are in the middle of all this. And so we're going to pray that God will protect the people, that his will will be done, and that Jesus will be glorified even in the midst of this terror that's happening. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for today. We do need the reminder, Lord. And we need to be reminded that we need to come to the end of ourselves as quickly as possible. We need to often be looking up to the one who provides and saying, unless you do something, I have nothing. And then, Lord, let us continue to be refreshed and blessed by the fact that not only do you multiply the meager circumstances that we have, but you produce an overabundance that even leaves us with some leftovers. But Father, this message of blessing and your care for us right now is really hard to understand for those who are in the Ukraine, for those who love you and yet are in the midst of just this horrible, terrifying moment. And so, Father, I pray as quickly as possible you would bring peace and resolve over there. We know you're the Lord over all. You're the Lord of life and death. Uh, but we do pray for rescue, Father. Would you protect your people and provide for them in the midst of this? And in all of this, may you get the credit and the glory and may Jesus be glorified in your holy name. Amen.